Thank you, Glyn, for reading. If you do want to get your Bibles back open to that Ephesians uh, chapter 5 passage, that would be really helpful. Let's see if I can find it. So we're on page 1176. It's page 1176. And also, in your service sheets this morning, there was a, a handout for you, which will kind of guide you through what I'm going to be saying this morning from this passage. I hope that's a help. Let's pray as we come to God's word now. Father, thank you so much that your word is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. And we pray that you speak to us through your word by your spirit now as we think about some difficult and challenging things. May how we do this bring honour and glory to you, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brilliant. So this morning I want to begin with a question about how do you wake up? How do you wake up? Are you quick out of bed? The alarm goes off, boing, you're up, you're out, you're ready to go. I'm looking from the blank faces here. That's not a common experience. When did you're one of those? Brilliant. That's good. Um, Becky, it's probably a hard question for you at the moment with a newborn. Oh no, I've got to get up again. But yeah, maybe you're a, a slow riser. You know the snooze button? One of your favourites? Mm, snooze, snooze, snooze. Maybe you're somewhere in between. Alarm's gone off. Okay, I need to get up. A couple of minutes later, you get up. Interesting question. In our reading today from Romans and from Ephesians, did you come across where it said, wake up? There's some things that we've got to wake up to today. And you could, if you like, view your Christian life like waking up. Perhaps you feel like you're a bit of a slow starter or a slow learner. A bit like that, oh, I've got to get out of bed. Oh. And then 20 minutes, a foot might appear. One of those. Maybe you feel like you made a really quick start in your walk with the Lord. And perhaps now you're losing a little bit of enthusiasm. Or maybe your walk with the Lord is just steady and undramatic. We'll think about that as we carry on. Now, we are looking, aren't we, in the book of Ephesians. You can see Ephesus on the map there. There are lots of similarities between the Ephesian context, when this book was written by the Apostle Paul, and our own. There are some differences. Okay, the weather here is not quite so good. But Ephesus was steeped in the cult of Artemis and all the sexual rituals that went with that. There was great sexual liberalism in the Ephesian context. Anything went and everything was celebrated. There was greed, there was impurity, and faith in Jesus was ridiculed. So the call for the Ephesians to live distinctive Christian lives would have stood out massively. And we're looking uh, in, over these few weeks in chapters 4 to 6 of the book of Ephesians. And these chapters help to ground the gospel truths, those amazing gospel truths we heard in chapters 1 to 3 in the life of the local church. We see how God's glorious plan is to unite all things under Christ. And this is what it looks like uh, in the local church. Now, in our context, faith in Jesus is often ridiculed. Or it's just ignored. There is great liberalism in our culture when it comes to sexual ethics. And the call to live distinctive Christian lives is as needed as ever, isn't it? So there's real parallels between Ephesus and here. Also, in our context, it's worth thinking through the fact that we're part of the Church of England here. And the Church of England at the moment is going through this process called Living in Love and Faith. You may have heard me mention that over recent weeks and months. What is living in love and faith? Um, well, this is uh, how it describes itself. It is a church-wide learning together, listening to one another and listening to God, is part of discerning a way forward for the Church of England in relation to matters of identity, sexuality, relationships and marriage. The purpose of the resources is to enable the Church of England churches across the country to participate in a process of learning and praying together as part of discerning a way forward 
in relation to matters of identity, sexuality, relationships and marriage. So Ephesians is a really helpful book for us to look at at this time. And um, if you ever go on our website and listen to some of our recordings, this is the graphic we're using at the moment for our series. Ephesians tells us that we are one in Christ. Brilliant. Chapters 1 to 3 are are brilliant at explaining that. And 4 to 6, chapters 4 to 6, we see the challenge to be who we are, called as God's people. If you remember last week with Ralph's smelly coat, we are to take off the old and to put on the new. As chapter 4 verse 1 tells us, to live a life uh, worthy of the calling we have received. So, um, all that comes, what we're going to look at today, is going to help us to think through what living a life worthy of the calling we've received looks like. And, as chapter 5 begins, we are to follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, to walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So all that comes is to help us live a life worthy of the Lord and to follow in the example of Jesus. And to do that, we're told in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, 5, sorry, Ephesians chapter 5, make sure I'm preaching on the right chapter, that we are to watch out for the darkness because it will destroy you. These are strong words. Watch out for the darkness, but it will destroy you. And to help us do that, the Apostle Paul tells us there's three things that we're to say no to. Three things, okay? Firstly, we're to say no to sexual immorality. We're to say no to impurity, and we're to say no to greed. We're going to look at all three. So look at verse 3. It says, but among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. So let's take the first one, sexual immorality. Here, the word that's used there, sexual immorality, translates the Greek word porneia from which we get words like pornography. And the word has a broad meaning of any kind of sexual activity that takes place outside of marriage, even between consenting adults. So this includes a whole range of things, like watching porn, reading erotic novels, visiting strip shows, flirting, lusting, all those things. And as difficult as we may find this in our sexually overheated society, it all also rules out all sexual activity of any kind outside of marriage. We're going to think more about marriage in a couple of weeks' time. Okay, That's what that sexual immorality word means. But please be clear, okay? God isn't against sex. He invented it. It's his gift. As the kind of thrilling and intimate glue for the lifelong union of one man and one woman in marriage. He's not against sex, but he is against sexual immorality. He is against his beautiful gift being abused. And so because of this clear teaching, we can see that the Bible clearly rules out homosexual sex. But the Bible isn't against people who are same-sex attracted, just as it's not against people who are opposite-sex attracted, but not married. The Bible is only against sexual immorality. And we must read all of this in the context of, just remember what we read at the start of chapter 5, of Jesus' sacrificial love for all, regardless of our sexuality. Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. So to say no to sexual immorality, we're also to say no to impurity. Now impurity, obviously it includes sexual immorality, but it's a broader vice, I think, that includes things like uh, sexual lust, but also other forms of licentiousness, if you like. So drunkenness, we're going to think more about that next week. Lewd conversations or riotous behaviour. The word impurity, it's not condemning godly joking or fun or dancing or partying. 
but it is condemning crudeness. And I think most of us can recognise the difference by asking ourselves whether or not Jesus would be happy with what we're doing or not. And this links to verse 4 where it says, Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. These are important things for us to be thinking through. And the third, no? Well, it's greed, isn't it? Greed is an unrestrained desire for more money, or for more food, or for more property, or for other material things. It makes us covetous of what other people have and bitter about what we don't. And I think it's probably the great unconfessed sin of our culture. And again, we're not denying the goodness of God's material gifts of prosperity. But for most of us, that's not our main problem. What we struggle with is the temptation to be hedonistic, indulging our appetites for pleasure, comfort, hoarding material wealth. And when things are just only a click away on Amazon, it's hard, isn't it? We want something, we can have it. And you can have it delivered the next day or even sometimes the same day. The contrast of that is obviously being joyful givers like God, modest in our lifestyle in order to be sacrificially generous to others. Now we read these challenging words in Ephesians 5 that there cannot be even a hint of these three ungodly things in our lifestyle or conversation because they are serious to God and they're improper for God's holy people. We need to watch out for the darkness because it will destroy us. So look at verse 5. It says, For this you can be sure, no immoral, impure or greedy person such a person as an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. There are eternal consequences for our behaviour here on earth. Now, looking at the list of immorality, impurity and greed, and comparing ourselves against the Lord's perfect standards, we are all guilty and condemned. Just consider Jesus' words from the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, where to look at another woman or man lustfully is like committing adultery with them. Jesus' standards are perfectly high, aren't they? So I stand before you today, humbly, as a greedy, immoral, and impure man. That's who you're looking at. I need Jesus to wash me clean. That's why we confess our sins each week. That's why I'd love to encourage you to confess your sins each day at home. That's why we come to communion regularly, with that physical reminder of our need for Jesus' death on the cross on our behalf. But it's important that we recognise there's a difference between falling into sin and a pattern of habitual and unrepentant ongoing sin. Okay? One commentator helpfully puts it like this. Those who habitually live in unrepentant sexual immorality, licentious impurity or material greed, not in occasional repented sins, but rather as a settled lifestyle, are idolaters because they are devoted to their desires instead of God's. If unrepentant, such people cannot have any inheritance from God in his kingdom. That's why it's so important that we're really clear what we mean by impurity, sexual immorality and greed. The touchstone issue for us in our culture, or at least the one that gets all the headlines, is about sexuality and sexual ethics. But I would argue that greed is just as big an issue. It really is, and it deserves our attention. So, that being the case, why are sexual ethics and the discussion about sexual immorality such a biggie at the moment? Let me explain. It's because the church publicly declares that greed is bad. There is universal agreement on that. Okay? But... In the Church of England, there is not universal agreement about what is meant by sexual immorality. That is why the Church of England is going through the living in love and faith process. 
But the problem with the living in love and faith process and the Church of England position as a whole is that it doesn't stand on the authority of Scripture and on the clear teaching of Jesus and the Apostles. Because the issue is we may well get to a point where the church says something is good that the Bible says has no place in the life of the believer. In fact, something that as we read in verse 5 would condemn someone to hell. That's why, although it's no fun and it's not easy, we must be clear on these things. If I were not to teach on these things as we come across them in Scripture, I would be doing all of this a disservice. And verse 6 and 7 of Ephesians 5 are helpful for us on this. There has always been, and will always be, someone ready to offer an easier and more acceptable ethic than what the Bible says. What we're facing now isn't new. So Paul counsels us to let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them, he says. Many, even within the church, are trying to deceive us by saying that things uh, that are wrong are actually okay. But we mustn't be deceived, and we must not become partners with them, so that we can call a dying world to life, a dark world to light, and the world under judgment to be living under the grace of God, which we remember we all desperately need. I desperately need to live under the grace of God. So, that's three things to say no to, but let's look positively at what we can say yes to. Okay? Walk as children of the light, because it will save those around you. Look at verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. What's Paul saying here? Well, we're not only motivated by the severe consequences of sin, but actually by the profound change that God has worked within us. We live in the light of the gospel, and amazingly, we are the light to others. As we are children of the light, we will live in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. That's a positive side to saying no to immorality, impurity, and greed. And it will make us stand out to those that we live around, just as it did for the Ephesians. And as we do this, we're to find out what pleases the Lord, in verse 10. Now, this isn't some kind of mysterious journey of discernment. Like, ooh, I wonder if God will like me doing this. Hmm, it feels good, so it must be right. It's not that kind of thing, no. You see, the Ephesians have already been told how to live. The challenge for the Ephesians and for us is to be who we are. To live lives that are consistent with our calling. They've been taught how to live. We've been taught how to live. There's loads of details in Ephesians chapter 4 that we've looked at over the past three weeks. Just look back to verses 11 uh, to 21 uh, of chapter 4 to help us with that. Verse 11 and 12 of our chapter 5 here tells us we're to live in a way that has nothing to do with the fruitless and shameful deeds of darkness. The challenge for them was to live that out in cosmopolitan Ephesus. Just as it is for us to do that in South East Derbyshire. As we do that, we will be light to others. We'll be a witness to the Lord Jesus. And then our passage ends with verses 13 and 14. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. See, the light exposes the darkness, and Christian, we've got to wake up to it. That is why we thought about how we wake up in the morning. Verse 14 is quoting from Isaiah chapter 60, and it's picked up in our reading from Romans chapter 13. God's people have to wake up to the challenge and reality of our calling. It's not easy. But we've been brought to life from death by the Lord Jesus who has loved us and given himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice. Redeeming those who are sexually immoral, those who are impure, those who are greedy, like me. Redeeming us and bringing us to new life. 
So let's live for him, walking in the light, saying no to immorality, impurity and greed, and living a life of love that will stand out like a bright light in the darkness to all those we live around. Now what I've said this morning might bring up some big issues for you. And so if you'd like to talk uh, about them on a more one-to-one basis, with either me or a trusted Christian friend, I would encourage you to do that. It's the best thing to live for the Lord Jesus. So may we all be encouraged to do that. And to help um, think through some of these things, at the bottom of the sermon handout are three questions that pick up on those three different areas that perhaps you could read through and think through in this week ahead as a help um, as we think about these things. Let me pray as we close. Father, Lord, we love you and we're so grateful that the Lord Jesus has willingly given himself up as a sacrifice for us. Father, help us to be who we are, people who walk in the light. And may we be a light to the world around us, a world that is so full of darkness. And help us, Lord, to continually come to you for repentance and for forgiveness uh, when we mess up and when we fall short. Thank you that your love is big enough to cover all of our sins. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the opportunity to think about these things this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Rob.